Welcome to The Hot Dish, comfort food for rural America. I'm Heidi Heitkamp, former U.S. Senator from North Dakota. If you're a Democrat in rural America, you might be feeling a little bit lonely, but cheer up. Guess what? You're not alone. On The Hot Dish, we're going to bring you smart conversations about issues and policies that matter most to small towns and rural communities across the United States. I have a new co-host. <laughs> uh, he is not somebody who is a stranger um, in, in my family because he's my brother. Joel Heikamp, who is not only a radio talk show host, but he is the most listened to voice, um, even though he has progressive leanings, not always, but progressive leanings, <laughs> um, but the most listened voice, uh, listened to voice in the upper Midwest, which I think is quite an endorsement of having the conversations that matter in rural America. So welcome, Joel. I, I know it's going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be fun working with you when you're pulling your share of the weight. <laughs> That's going to be a fun I, You know, I'm a recovering politician myself, folks. I served in North Dakota State Senate for 14 years. So I've eaten my share of hot dish. I've been to a lot of funerals. Well, you about. look like you've eaten your share of hot dish, Joel. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, there's so many things I could yeah, say now, but, but I'm in your office. I mean, but here's the thing. It, we need to have conversations about what's going on in rural uh, America, and we need to talk a little bit about, uh, as progressives, as Democrats, what we've won and because of the things we've won, what we lost. You know, when you're successful and they don't need you anymore, sometimes they brush you aside. And I think some of that's going on in, in rural America. And I think a, a good thing uh, for us to do is to have those conversations and not be afraid to have those conversations. So I plan on talking a lot. Uh, if you're with Heidi, you, you've got to, because it's the only way you can get a word in. Out of the seven of us, uh, I'm by far the most popular. <laughs> it's not true. Yeah. Absolutely not true. Our guest today is Sarah Godlewski. And Sarah has an amazing political history. She hails from the great state of Wisconsin where she's currently this new Secretary of State, taking over for someone who had the job for 41 years before her. Before that, she was the elected state's treasurer. Um, and importantly, I met Sarah when she was running for the United States Senate in the last cycle. Um, she didn't make it through the primary, but man, she made an impression, an impression on me big time. She's also a businesswoman, a philanthropist, and she is a member of the One Country Board. Welcome, Sarah. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Heidi. It's so good to be here. Well, Wisconsin, guess what? We did it. We did it. Sarah, I've never seen a state Supreme Court race get so much natural attention, so much, much national money. It was absolutely amazing. Can you tell us about this unique candidate that is Janet Protasiewicz? We're still celebrating here in Wisconsin, Heidi, about the Supreme Court victory. And I would say we're celebrating for a few reasons. I mean, obviously, this race, we're kind of laying it all on the field um, because electing Janet to the Supreme Court really had two significant impl implications. One is who's going to control our Supreme Court? Is it going to be more of the conservatives or the liberals? And so, now, um, starting in August, we're going to have a 4-3 majority. But the terms here in Wisconsin, it, they're 10 years. So Janet will now be serving for an entire decade. And in this Supreme Court election, we had 1.8 million people turn out. It was a record-breaking turnout across the entire state. And it was women. It was rural, it was urban, it was everybody. And I think the other unique thing I just want to point out about Janet's particular victory is it wasn't just the cities of Madison and Milwaukee. Literally, she won the entire state. Well, one thing that we've seen is the issue of choice and abortion has been playing out in rural states, in rural parts of our states, in ways that I don't think uh, the Republicans ever thought they would. For years, this has been a one-issue voting block for the Republican Party. But having now had Roe versus Wade reversed has totally flipped the, the table. And so 
Um, do you think that in rural America it was the choice issue or do you think it was redistricting? What do you think motivated um, the turnout? I think what it came down to when I was traveling the state and I did a lot of campaigning for Janet and talking to folks, they were talking about freedom. They don't want the government taking away their freedoms. And so for them, the Roe v. Wade issue was often something that we talked about because they were like, I don't want a politician telling me what I can what I can be doing. Like, they shouldn't be in my medical exam room. To them, they really felt like it was a, a step too far. And if they can take away rights from half a population, from women in our state, what rights are they going to be able to take away next? And so I do think that was a really prominent issue um, that I know folks were talking about in rural Wisconsin. But look, like they also do care about democracy. And in a state where despite winning statewide, we only took 34 percent of the legislature, it's pretty clear that the you know one person, one vote isn't true when it comes to our legislative maps here in the state of Wisconsin. But I think we, at the end of the day, whether it was, you know, I was talking to folks in Pepin County or Polk County, freedom was a theme that often was constantly rising. There's this silent majority out there in, in rural states that for years they've had the right to abortion. And they just took it for granted. And they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to go to the Legion Hall. They don't want to go to the VFW Hall and say, I stand up for abortion, uh, especially in my home area where the majority of them are Catholic. And so, you know, it, finally they get to vote after they pull the curtain for it. And if I were the Republicans in the rural area, I'd be really afraid of this. Yeah, and Joe, it's funny. One of my most memorable stories on the campaign trail was talking to um, a guy in a, a very small town here in western Wisconsin and going up to the front door and you just got all the vibes that he just wasn't on the team. <laughs> um, but, you know, you got to talk to everybody, right? That's how we win voters. And that's you got to show up and listen too. that's a big part of it. And so knock on the door, start talking to this. This guy opens it and he's like, so uh where are you with this women's rights abortion stuff? And I go, well, this candidate, Janet's for making sure a woman has the right to choose. And he goes, you know what? That's what I'm voting for this year. I'm just sick of them taking away our freedom, Sarah. And he just went off and it was not what I was expecting at all. And then to your point, Joe, he started saying about at the local coffee shop, that's what they're starting now to talk about. And this is like the first time he said that they felt, I think, in a place where they could openly talk about this and what this meant for the future of this country. Well, it's obvious that Wisconsin's going to play an outsized role in the 2024 election with what might be a competitive state U.S. Senate race. But also, you're always going to uh, be a big player in the presidential. We saw in this race for the state Supreme Court a youth vote turning out. We saw rural America turning. Can can this momentum continue, Sarah, going into 2024? Well, when I talk to youth across the state of Wisconsin, they're not going away. And I think, too, the more and more the Republicans talk about what they can do to stifle the youth vote just further energizes them. So we saw a record-breaking turnout for young people in the state of Wisconsin in a Supreme Court election. And again, when you talk to them, what is motivating you to vote? They talk about rights. They talk about their right to choose. They talk about marriage equality, the right to make sure they can drink clean water, and they're using their vote to change that, which is exactly what a democracy is about. But even I think more frightening, Heidi, is What's been talked about in the donor circles on the right is how they want to, you know, try to maybe take away polling places that are close to campuses or make it harder for youth to vote. And, and that's not what democracy is about in our state or in our country. And so I do know that the youth vote's not going away. They're really motivated. And I, I do believe that energy is going to continue into 2024 and, quite frankly, even beyond. Well, the, the question I would have in those regards, it, and 
I mean, I'd kill to be in Wisconsin where you actually have a chance to win an election. But in North Dakota, it's about as red as you can possibly be. And I would argue getting more red. They just passed the, the strictest abortion ban that you could have in the nation, making national news all over the place. And so, you know, what, what they seem to do, Sarah, is they're making the rules harder and harder to be able to undo the idiocy of what they do. And I'm curious how that's playing out in Wisconsin. You're exactly right, Joel. I think in order for them to win, because they can't win the popular vote when you look at it statewide. So they got to change the rules of the game, which to me is something that we need to be watching as we know our democracy has, is incredibly fragile after 2020. But whether it's trying to make it harder for, for young people to vote, to consolidating their power through gerrymandering, to most Recently, when you look at the election bills that are coming out of our legislature, it's really about making it harder to get access to the ballot. Let me let me kind of say the interesting thing for me is the Republicans don't sit back and say, what about our policies don't youth like and how do we um, talk or or have a conversation like we're doing about rural America? You know, we we aren't sitting around. Uh, disparaging rural America. We're trying to figure out how do we have a conversation about our values and our beliefs and why we believe that our policies are the best policies. What they're saying is, let's change the rules because these these young people have been duped and they're just like lemmings that will jump over the cliff. I mean, the more they talk like that, the less likely they are going to win hearts and minds of youth voters. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing to me how they've reacted to this surgence of youth voting. And Heidi, when you look at college campuses in Wisconsin, the turnout there was, as we've all talked about, was the highest it's ever been, but it was 80, 90 percent for Janet over the Republican candidate. And I do think it was it was these issues that that they were talking about and we were seeing it in in campuses that are much more rural, too. They were having kind of the same the same effect. But I want to back it up just a sec, because there's a reason all three of us are excited. Wisconsin gave us a reason to be excited. But do they go away? Well, youth go away, because there's a lot longer history of, of youth not turning out at the ballot box than there is of them turning out at the ballot box. And Sarah, I'm curious how that's going to play out in Wisconsin. Well, I don't think it's going to go away for a long time. And, and for starters, I don't think it's going to go away because we're still going to be waiting for clarity on this 1849 abortion ban. And so as long as abortion is banned in this state, women and their families are going to continue to be reminded about their inability to make their own health care choices. And, and instead of it being hypothetical, Joe, we're actually hearing these horrifying stories of women who are being you know, in, in my community in Western Wisconsin, a woman literally was in the ER. She was going septic. She was, I think, 23 weeks pregnant at the time, but going septic. And she was uh, in this ER trying to figure out, could she get to Minnesota in time? Wow. And these stories are becoming more and more common the longer this 1849 abortion ban is our reality. So I, I don't think it's going to go away. I think if anything, this has they have seen, unlike at least in my generation, for the first time, rights being taken away from an entire population. I mean, my lifetime, we've only seen rights be gained, not be lost. And now that this generation has experienced that, they're not going to forget it. Obviously, Wisconsin is hugely important going into the 2024 election. I think the Republicans still think it's up for grabs, and I think the Democrats are feeling a little bit better about it. And so it's going to be an interesting path forward. But we know that you are going to be there as the new Secretary of State protecting people's right to vote, expanding people's right to vote, making sure that that franchise is available to every qualified elector. And so thank you for taking on that challenge, Sarah. Thank you for all the great work that you've done. And thank you for continuing with us that One Country Project to 
insist that rural America have a voice in American politics. For sure, Heidi. As you know, part of it is showing up and making sure that we listen. And that's exactly what we did in the spring election. And that's exactly what we're going to continue to do. Fun visiting with you, Sarah. Thanks for having me. It's always good to be back. (laughs) Coming up, the Hot Dish caught up with uh, Yoshi Gaetan, uh, one of the -the on-the-ground organizers who played a huge role in turning out the vote at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, where 85% of the voters voted for Janet Prosadowicz. Those are numbers that any politician would dream about. This is Yoshi Gaetan in her own words. My name is Rosalind Gaetan, but everyone knows me as Yoshi, so you can call me Yoshi. I am a fourth year here at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. I currently serve as a student body president. I'm a first-generation student. My family uh, largely comes from Mexico. A lot of people in, in my ancestry have fought really hard for me to be able to speak and be where I am. On the Supreme Court, I'll be a common sense judge. I'll the protect. elections, Janet Protasewicz was running for Supreme Court justice. Thank God she won. And a lot of the work that I did centered around ensuring that people knew what it was that she was advocating for and knowing that they had a voice within this election. Protasewicz. Protasewicz. Protosawitz. I'm Judge Janet Protosawitz. Protosawitz. Her last name is notoriously difficult to pronounce. Part of her campaign was people not being able to pronounce it. I think it's nice to be able to know that people can poke fun at themselves and and can joke, but also can be very serious and know what they want and and be able to be forward about it. I believe in a woman's freedom to make her own decision on abortion. It's there was a lot happening on campus, so people knew that this was important. They knew what was at stake. Um, people were pissed. People were angry. People were scared. People were nervous. I think every sort of emotion was out there. I remember I went to campus and I was running around that morning. I had a bunch of other things I was doing, but the line was so long. It was so long. Um, And I actually don't live on campus. So my line was a little bit shorter. But for those who lived on campus, they waited there for, oh, man, I saw the same people in line for at least a good at least 30 minutes. I think it was exciting because people knew that they were going to go vote and they were going to go place their ballot for who they wanted and who they believed in. I think the biggest thing was after That definitely felt more tense later that night. I think a lot of people were just waiting to hear results, and that was a lot more nerve-wracking. I was with my roommates, and all three of us were just sitting there, and we were waiting and, you know, walking around the house and talking with each other and hoping and praying that it would be the results that we wanted. And then the news broke, and we celebrated. I could not have done it without the hard work and dedication of all of you right here in this room. Which was incredible, incredible numbers. I think that's what Judge Protozawick did did best is that she connected with people and she spoke with people and she was honest and she knew what was on the line. When people find out like, oh, like I have a lot of like kick-ass power and I can do whatever I want with it and I should be able to speak my mind. I should be able to talk about my rights and I should be able to have security in my in my personhood. It's awesome. And I think that that empowerment is incredible. So feel whatever it is that you're feeling. If you're angry, if you're sad, take it and run with it. Run with it. Let that motivate you. Let that turn into optimism. Um, and that was something that I had mentioned during one of my speeches is that What they create at these rallies or at these events or at these speakings or whatever it is, it's fire. It really is. It's fire and it's a fire that cannot be put out by anyone. And you can't let them put it out because as soon as you let them, they win. So let them call you a troublemaker. Let them call you uh, someone who who's being a pest. And and I don't want to hear any more about voting. No, it's important. And never let that fire die. Never let the optimism die. As my listeners know, I am passionate about rural America and don't want to see it left behind. 
We're bringing together rural leaders and federal policymakers for a three-day summit in June so we can keep the dialogue going and make sure our voices are heard in Washington. Sarah's going to be very involved in that, and she's going to be having a conversation with the Michigan Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, to talk about election security. For more information about how you can join, check out the OneCountryProject.com. It's going to be a great summit. Uh, they found just the right person to host a panel on the future of media in rural America, and that's me. Uh, I get a chance to do it. Register at OneCountryProject.com and take part. Thanks so much for listening to The Hot Dish. We'll be serving up many more great conversations that matter to rural America. So stay tuned. We're going to see you in a couple weeks.